This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, two weeks until the 200th rowing of the Royal St. John's Regatta. And we're live at Kitty Vitty Lake and we'll ask how weather has affected practice times. We're advising that, they, uh, that the retention fishery uh, end for the, for the remainder of the season. I'm not, very, I'm not supportive of it at all. Salmon stocks in danger. Scientists say shut it down. But the minister says keep fishing. Oh. Prettiest girl at St. Olaf College. We were married in 1962, all right? I know who you are and I know who I am. And remembering a popular whale researcher, a play exploring the life of John Leon is set to open at the LSPU Hall. Tonight, we look at the play and Leon's work. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Arianna Kelland. We start tonight with details of a presumed drowning in Torbay. A man has been taken from the water in Whiteways Pond this afternoon. The Torbay Fire Department was called to the pond around 3 o'clock this afternoon after a young man was in trouble in the water. The RNC also responded. And it called in a cold water rescue team from the St. John's Fire Department. Torbay's fire chief says the man couldn't be seen at first. We got on the scene and we couldn't see the person in the water. Uh, a couple of bystanders said they had seen him there probably just before we arrived. And we waited for the cold water rescue crew and in a few minutes they had him located. They were working on, they were doing CPR as they loaded them in the ambulance. This could be the fifth drowning in the province in the past week. The string of tragedy falls within National Drowning Prevention Week. Salmon stocks on the island are in trouble and DFO scientists recommend closing all rivers to retention fishing for the rest of the season. But the province's fisheries minister rejects that science and the recommendation. Here now is Megan McCabe has been following this. She's joining us now live. Megan, what did DFO say? If you're a salmon angler who's already kept the one fish limit for this season, you're in luck. If not, you may not get to enjoy that delicious, freshly caught Atlantic salmon. DFO gave its mid-season review of stocks in Newfoundland this morning, and it's not good. Its analysis is based on river stocks from May until just a few days ago, called returns, then comparing that to the same data from past years, as well as the final returns from the end of the seasons to figure out how stocks are doing. We are somewhat concerned. Uh, obviously, you can't, these Declines of this magnitude can't continue forever. If you keep seeing declines below your recent five-year mean, you'll eventually have no fish. That's as simple as that. DFO predicts more than 50% of assessed rivers will fall below their mean for the last five years, and it's the third year in a row they'll be that low. Scientist Jeff Vinot says the problem is in the ocean, with salmon leaving and not coming back. It's a tough one to figure out, but he says stocks have rebounded quickly before, and a strictly catch-and-release fishery would help. Part of it is to stop harvesting them, because every fish that's removed is a fish that is not available to spawn. Fisheries Minister Jerry Byrne doesn't buy DFO's science. He held his own press conference this morning in Cornerbrook to give an update on a provincial study of catch and release fishing. Anglers throughout the entire province are experiencing, they're witnessing high, high, high returns in the last number of days and weeks. Uh, DFO is basing the decision based on the full time series from late May until a few short weeks ago and they may not necessarily be strongly reflecting the increased returns in recent days and weeks. DFO actually collected data until Sunday, so three days, not quite as far back as Burns says. But the minister has been criticizing DFO's salmon management all season, despite conservation groups applauding its measures. As for DFO, it has to take the recommendations from its scientists and decide what to do. So we don't know yet if rivers will be closed. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Megan McCabe. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau shuffled his cabinet today, and that means a new federal minister of fisheries, this one from Canada's west coast. Vancouver MP Jonathan Wilkinson takes on the role. He's a new minister in Trudeau's cabinet. Before this role, he was a parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. He was first elected as an MP in 2015. 
The previous fisheries minister, Dominic LeBlanc, moves to the Department of Intergovernmental Affairs, Northern Affairs and Internal Trade. It's just two weeks until the 200th running of the Royal St. John's Regatta, and with the highest number of crews signed up to date, the event is certainly going to make a splash at Kitty Vitty Lake in St. John's. That's where here now's Jeremy Eaton is tonight. Jeremy, how is training going? Well, we're just here uh, on the dock near the boathouse, and it's a pretty busy spot as crews are getting their final practice runs in before the big day in two weeks weather permitting and speaking of weather it hasn't been a great year for rowing so if you're sitting at home thinking it's been kind of windy this summer it's even worse for rowing so when there's high winds there's a red flag and a red flag means no go on the row now last week there's a tropical storm was set to come through here and that was going to drop a lot of rain here on Kitty so the regatta committee teamed up with the city of St. John's and they opened up the dam they drained a little bit of water and that caused a small issue as well because when the water levels dropped uh, red flags went up for a couple days and crews couldn't get their practice runs in. But as you can see now, the suns are out and the guns are out pulling the rows, sorry, the oars through the water and everybody's uh, having a good time here and it's starting to get a little bit busier here on the dock. So while it was nice yesterday and it was nice down here today, what does tomorrow hold? And that's a question that we all know that Carolyn Stokes can answer. Carolyn? Well, Jeremy, those winds will certainly be lasting tomorrow. We can expect those southwesterlies 30 gusting to 50 to continue tomorrow. And there is some wet weather on the way, as you can see from our satellite and radar. This uh, wet weather tracking on the west coast of the island, making its way towards the east overnight tonight, bringing some thunder showers to the south coast as well. So here's a look at uh, your winds for tomorrow and also for the precipitation. I thought I'd focus on uh, the Avalon because of the regatta and all of the practice rowing happening. So here we are at 4 a.m. for the early birds getting up. You can see that lots of cloud and uh, the potential for some showers, maybe even some thunder showers early tomorrow morning. And those winds are staying up 30 gusting to 50. And those showers are going to intensify throughout the day as we get into tomorrow evening. I thought I'd uh, show you this viewer picture. Thank you very much, Bill Perks, for sending this in. Here's our early outlook for tomorrow in St. John's metro area. 18 degrees with a chance of showers. Those thunder, thunder showers along the south coast there. Showers in central Newfoundland tomorrow morning as you start your day. And for the rest of the province, lots of sunshine. Now, there's also a heat warning that's still in effect. I'll tell you about that a bit later. The provincial government announced this morning it will provide coverage for the abortion pill and it will be available at no cost as of September 1st. This province is the last in the country to provide the coverage. Here now Stephen Miller has the reaction. Miffy Guy Miso is more commonly known as the abortion pill. That pill has been in use for 30 years but has only been available in Canada for a little over a year. Women's health experts say this offers a less invasive alternative to a traditional surgical abortion and are pleased it'll be offered here. You take the pills, you can structure that around your own time frame. So say you have the weekend off, you could take the first pill, you know, Thursday evening or Friday evening and then take the second set of pills Friday or Saturday and you can structure it around your time off and it's more private. Obviously you're doing it in your home. This decision comes after years of advocating by women's health care experts and a recent push by Memorial University's Medical Student Society. They sent a letter to the provincial government that included almost a dozen expert signatories. Medical abortions that use the pill have a success rate of 95% in the first 50 days of pregnancy in comparison to a surgical abortion, which is 100% effective. There is also more follow-up involved. Health Canada guidelines state that you have to have an ultrasound, so you want to make sure that the person is pregnant, that the pregnancy is in fact inside the uterus, and also you want to establish the gestational age because you can only use this product up to nine weeks of gestation. Depending on the popularity of the abortion pill, healthcare centers may see increased demands for quick access to ultrasounds. Mifigimiso will be available from the 1st of September. One of the things we need to do is to make sure that the uh, uh, RHA ultrasound uh, uh, departments are equipped to uh, provide a rapid turnaround for uh, people who would be requiring an ultrasound that early on in pregnancy. Essentially, it's for anyone who um, carries a valid MCP card. Uh, we would act as insurer of last resort, so if uh, the person concerned had their own private insurance, uh, that would be drawn down first. 
If you are looking for more information on Miffy Guy Maizo, you can contact one of the several women's health centers in the city. Stephen Miller, CBC News, St. John's. There was criticism this week after the announcement of a new board of directors for Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro. The board was made up of nine women and nine men rather and just one woman. The government will now be looking to add four more women to the board, but it did raise the question of the glass ceiling. The three women you're about to meet have broken through the glass ceiling in areas where women haven't traditionally had leadership roles. You're going to meet Anne Whalen, head of the board of directors for Newfoundland Power, Noreen Golfman, Vice President at Memorial University, and Victoria Belbin, CEO of the Canadian Home Builders Association. Predominantly men sitting around the table. In many cases, I may have been the only woman in the room. I would say the glass ceiling is, uh, is being cracked but not shattered yet. Uh, you know, in the case of our organization, we uh, identify, Newfoundland Power, we identify the skills we need and then we actively seek candidates who can fit the skills that are required to govern the organization. And we look for candidates who will increase our diversity. It's not just filling a quota, it's about changing the conversation and making sure it's a very transparent and inclusive approach to governance. It's really hard in 2018 to imagine that there aren't people who are capable of sitting on a board uh, who happen to have a double X chromosome and uh, all the skills and all the qualifications, all the experience. Whether they come forward or not, that is a different issue and suggests again that maybe we should be more proactive or mandate gender parity on boards. But to say that you're looking for merit, that merit-based argument is so tired and so old and so dated. Um, there's a lot of evidence and a lot of literature to suggest that that is a pretty loaded, loaded comment. One uh, older guy said to me, so Anne, would you be prepared to be a token woman on a board? And I, uh, you know, I wasn't sure what to say with that. And I thought about it for a minute. I said, well, you know, I might be on the way in the door, but I wouldn't be on the way out. I really haven't seen a glass ceiling in my career. I knew it existed, but uh, I think that today in our current environment, if there's a willingness and there's a desire and there's passion, you can get there, you being anybody. There are times when um, you wonder why things haven't moved quickly enough or why people are still arguing that it's merit and gender has nothing to do with it. Newfoundland Hydro Board in particular, uh, you know, that's a, that's a big job and uh, it requires, uh, you know, directors on the board who are able to govern that organization. We can wait for another hundred years, but uh, I think to use a, a popular phrase these days, time's up. Now we spoke to the Minister of Natural Resources earlier this week about this topic. Siobhan Cody says the government has been making strides toward gender parity. Cody says with provincially appointed boards in the province, the makeup is 53% men and 47% women. Accused murderer Stephen Neville is in more hot water. Neville has been rearrested for allegedly assaulting a woman. He's facing new charges of assault, distribution of an intimate image, and breaching bail conditions. Neville was convicted in the 2013 stabbing death of Doug Flynn. The conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court of Canada in 2015, but a retrial is set for the fall. Tomorrow, a bail hearing will be held to decide if he'll stay in custody until his new murder trial in September. More progress was made today in the Avalon Mall makeover. This large pedway was hoisted above O'Leary Avenue this morning. It will be connected to a new 800 space parking garage. It's all part of a major redesign plan that aims to give the 50-year-old mall a facelift. Upgrades will include a new entrance and changes to the mall's major intersections. 
The St. John's Edge is losing one of its star players. Point guard Karan Williams has signed with a team in Argentina. The American started with the Edge in January and became a key asset to the team. Williams was one of seven players on the Edge's protected list for next season. He took to Twitter to thank fans and call the league first class. Williams will begin playing in the top circuit in Argentina this winter. And tonight, the St. John's Edge is officially welcoming back two players. The team has re-signed Desmond Lee and Jaron Skeet for one-year contracts. Just a beautiful evening in St. John's, a crowd down at Kitty Bitty Lake. People across the city were outside today enjoying, enjoying the warm weather and sunny skies. And it got us wondering about what your favorite things are about summer. Here and now's Kate McGilfrey was at Bannerman Park to ask people some hard-hitting questions about their summer favorites. Flip-flops or sneakers? Oh, neither. Neither? Yeah, what, what am I wearing now? Nothing. Flip-flops. Sneakers. What? I can't drive in flip-flops. <laughs> I'd say flip-flops during the summer. Yeah, definitely. Hard ice cream or soft serve? Oh, soft serve. It's just smooth. Depends on if my favorite flavors are for hard ice cream. What's your favorite? Tiger. Definitely soft serve. December or July? July. I hate winter. So this is your time to shine. Exactly. This time, everything shines. Why December? Snow. And Christmas. December. <laughs> I like Christmas. July. My birthday's in July. <laughs> This animal could once throw itself clear out of the water. A new play about the whale man is set to open. Between Breaths tells the story of the late John Lean, his pioneering work rescuing whales and his battle with dementia.
The world premiere of a play about the late John Lean is set to open tomorrow at the LSPU Hall in St. John's. Between Breaths is about the person simply known as the Whale Man. But there was nothing simple about Dr. John Lean. He was an American biologist who came to Memorial University in the late 60s, and his life's work blended science with his passion for saving trapped whales. This is pretty unusual experience to have someone upside down looking through a snorkel. And, you know, a space alien for sure in their world. And they would do an eye catch with me. I, I can, you can tell when I'm looking at your nose or looking into your eyes. And they would look into my eyes. <laughs> John Lean was legendary, a researcher and marine educator, admired by conservationists and fishermen alike for his pioneering work in setting up the whale release program in the early 80s, a scientist out in the field. And he understood the ecology and how everything was all intertwined, how the uh, ocean, the birds, the fish, and the fishermen and the whales, and that they were in it together. And he see that there was a need to, to start doing some protection and education. And especially there was a need to take whales out of fishing gear because someone needed to be doing that. Leon invited Wayne Ledwell to join him 30 years ago, a fisherman who knew nothing about whales and who carries on Leon's work to this day. One thing that he really did teach us is that if there's a whale cutting gear, you're going to get it out. The job was there, the job had to be done. That was his work in the morning when you came into John's office. He had a stack of papers that high on his desk. He never went home and that desk was totally clean. And then he'd go home work in his garden. It was like, uh, it was intimidating. I was working with him because he was just such a, he was such a hard worker. So Wayne, freeing entangled whales, I mean, it's really risky business. They're huge, powerful animals. What do you think drove John Lean to do that? Whale hunting had just ended in Canada and North America in 1972, so uh, animals started to get, were getting caught in fishing gear again, and, and people didn't understand nothing about the biology of these animals, and so he, uh, uh, he took it, uh, he, he saw that uh, this is, was also a huge challenge, uh, and, uh, and John was a fellow that loved challenges. This animal, this animal could once throw itself clear out of the water, 40 tons of muscle, fat, and bone, launched like a rocket, a breach. And no one's entirely sure why they do it. Some speculate that it's to find relief from the barnacles that are burrowing into their skin. Others think that it's merely play, fun. Now, having seen it more than once after a successful net release, I might be tempted to say it's nothing if not joy. A rehearsal of Between Breaths, how to capture the essence of the whale man through artistic license. No small endeavor. Playwright Robert Chafe was first drawn to how Leon was a bridge between the two worlds of conservation and industry. I thought that was the emotional content of the show, um, and that's in the show. But once we started researching his life and, and seeing the later stages of his life, um, his illness and his eventual death, um, there became a part of the show that was about uh, the kind of quality of life that we have and the legacy that we lead, leave behind us when we go. At the end of his life, John Lean was confined to a wheelchair, his mind lost to dementia. But that's where the play begins and stretches backwards. Free of the wheelchair. Free of the walker. Free of the cane to a time when Lean was the whale man. Talk to us about the almost spiritual connection that John seemed to have with these magnificent creatures. He talked about looking into the eyes of the whales and they're looking back. One of the first things famously he said that he would do when he was doing a whale rescue was to try to locate the eye and make a connection with the whale so that the whale could see him. He talked about it having a calming effect on the animal, that the animal could see what was happening around it. It's a cruel irony, isn't it, that he spent decades freeing trapped mm -hmm. whales and 
and he becomes trapped himself because of dementia. It became very, very clear to us that there was a kind of a very big metaphorical tie between uh, the whales that John was helping uh, in those situations and John himself later in life. So there's all this kind of metaphorical imagery in the show of John being the whale and John being underwater and all that kind of stuff. It, it's really important to the show as a character, as a person, he was huge. I mean, he wasn't, <laughs> you know, whales were physically huge. John was spiritually and emotionally a huge man. He, um, the way he lived his life, he was absolutely fearless. People, over and over again, people would talk to me about, um, he would always, you know, go from point A to point B. He never saw obstacle. He would just act and then think later. Uh, absolutely fearless man. Told me you knew you were home just from what you saw out the plane window, remember? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Called me and told me we were moving just like that. Yeah, I remember. We had... As a writer trying to capture this story, that it would be seen through the lens of celebration and joy and hugeness and fearlessness and bravery. And so we, we worked really, really hard to frame the story that way, to not make it a story that's uh, about illness and death and sadness, but that's about celebration of a life lived. quite emotionally strong mm -hmm. the play it actually made me cry wow. when I was over there at the shoot yeah I'm not surprised just by looking at your piece and a lot of talent involved in this play too Absolutely. you see them like uh, between breaths is an artistic fraud production written of course by Robert Chafe it's directed by Jill Kiley uh, with music by the once it starts tomorrow at the LSPU Hall sold out I'm told but it runs until the 29th <laughs> This is the most popular brew at Gander's new craft brewery. That's what everyone has loved so far is the red. That's done quite well. Just putting in some hot water so that we can uh, mix our grains with it. Bottoms up, coming up on Here and Now.
Your update is brought to you by Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 570 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can, too. Carolyn, another hot, sticky day in yeah. St. John's, but have we actually been the hottest yet? Well, you know, Labrador can take that honor, but things are changing up there. The heat warnings are now over, and uh, I wanted to start actually with some uh, temperatures from yesterday because more records were broken in Labrador. So just have a look at this. Yeah, mostly in the southeastern portion of Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay got up to 33.5 degrees yesterday. The hot spot, Mary's Harbor at almost 35 degrees and uh, Cartwright as well broke a record yesterday. So today not so much. Uh, 25 degrees was the high in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So a bit of relief from those hot temperatures. 22 in Cartwright. The real hot spot is the central portion of the island. 29 degrees for Lassie today and those warm temperatures are going to continue uh, in that part of the island. So we do have this wet weather on the way. It's tracking up through the Maritimes now over the west coast. That's going to make its way uh, over to the east overnight tonight and bring some wet weather uh, tomorrow. So you can see the intense shower activity happening overnight tonight. This is 11 o'clock tonight and uh, that's going to continue. We're looking at some heavy shower action there for the south coast. That's where the most rain is expected to fall overnight tonight. 10 to 20 millimeters expected there. Just about two millimeters uh, here in the east. Corner Brook could see about five to 10 millimeters of rain and just check out those overnight lows. It's going to be pretty hot tonight. 18 degrees still in the overnight hours. So cool down though for Labrador and a chance of showers there tonight. So as I mentioned, we still have this heat warning in effect for the Bay of Exploits uh, for Bonavista North and that whole area. So tomorrow temperatures are going to be in the upper 20s, but they're going to feel like the mid 30s. So it's going to stay very, very hot there tomorrow. And as you saw, we also had that fog advisory still in place for the south coast. So Thursday uh, morning, you can see those showers tracking particularly across the Buren Peninsula there. Lots of thunder shower activity expected there on the Avalon starting off pretty cloudy there, but we will see some of those showers and you can see some of the showers moving towards uh, Western Labrador as a well throughout tomorrow. The heavier shower activity looks to be uh, in the evening hours on Thursday night. So here's your temperatures for tomorrow. 21 degrees as the high for St. John's, about five to 10 millimeters of rain expected. And you can see that risk of thunderstorms throughout the day tomorrow. Another 10 to 20 millimeters of rain for the Placentia, uh, Marystown, Harbor, Breton area tomorrow. As you move into central areas, it starts to dry off a little bit. They won't see as much shower activity, but there still is a chance of some showers and you can see those temperatures in the mid 20s there. A little bit of a break from the hot temperatures on the west coast there. Corner Brook looking at 20 degrees tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud and some nice weather coming for the Straits in southeastern Labrador. Mix of sun and cloud for Cartwright and a uh, little bit of rain coming for Labrador City tomorrow. Not a whole lot, about two to four millimeters and some much cooler temperatures there. Happy Valley Goose Bay still staying warm tomorrow, but not in the warning level uh, criteria. So a little bit of a break there. Uh, so how is your weekend looking? So far, so good. I will have those details coming up. Well, there's another player on the craft beer scene. Scud Runner Brewing open in Gander in May. Here now is Garrett Barry dropped by the brewery to learn how the beer is brewed. Beer lovers, it's your day. We're making about 1,100 liters today. Enough for 25 kegs. First things first. I've got about 250 liters of water in here. Um, we're gonna start adding our grains. So uh, this is the exercise part of the day. Ten big bags into this, called a mash tun. Might get a nice smell coming now. Then the stirring. You cook this soup, then into another pot, and then into the fermenter. That's just the start. It takes weeks. Um, it's slowly every day the yeast is eating up all the sugar, and then the yeast will drop to the bottom of the fermenters uh, when it's done and all the alcoholic beer will be on top. And when the two weeks or more is over, you end up with this, called Scud Runner Red, the most popular brew on tap. 
in my younger days, I didn't really like beer. I'll say that, I'll admit it. Uh, I thought it all tasted the same. When he moved to England, that changed. I learned to love beer over there. I moved back to Newfoundland finally, but the beer hadn't really changed a whole lot. Then came the vision. The name was first, Scud Runner, a callback to his 20 years as a pilot. Trying to avoid flying in the clouds and trying to avoid contact with the ground at the same time. So it's bad weather if to fly under the clouds to get where you're going. It's usually a kind of a frowned upon thing because it's a little dangerous and it relies a lot on experience and intuition. An independent attitude, that's Scud Runner's vision. I'm really excited to get up and go to work and come here. I wasn't so much like that when I was at the, at the end of the flying. I, I don't know, I feel like I get to contribute a little bit more to my immediate community in the, in the world, a little more completely, I suppose. You can find these beers in Gander and a few stores in St. John's. By the end of the year, Jarrett hopes it will be in NLC stores. Then Scud Runner will really be taking off. Garrett Berry, CBC News. Gander. That's Inuk soprano Deantha Ramsey Edmonds singing in Inuktitut to the opening of the 2018 Inuit Circumpolar Council Assembly in Alaska. Edmonds grew up in Cornerbrook and has worked extensively with Dr. Tom Gordon, who's accompanying, accompanying her there. In the 18th century, Moravian missionaries brought classical music from Germany to northern Labrador. There, the music was reimagined by Inuit musicians and became a centerpiece of religious celebrations. This winter, Edmonds and Gordon were instrumental in putting together a concert of that music in St. John's. Peaches or nectarines? Peaches. Neither. <laughs> you don't like peaches or nectarines? I only like fuzzy peaches. 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 I don't even know what nectarines are, so I'm just going to say peaches. The regatta. Are you going to go or stay home? Definitely going. I'm away. Oh no. So I'm very upset about it. I always go. It's the first one I won't be going to. In your whole life? Mm hmm So I haven't been for four or five years. I uh, love the regatta. I do definitely go down. It's only two weeks until the, ro the 200th running of the Royal St. John's regatta. We're gonna, there's still lots of work left to do. We're gonna hear from the captain of the course coming up after the break.
Lots to do and not much time to do it in. The biggest Royal St. John's regatta to date is only two weeks away, weather permitting, of course, and organizers have been getting ready for a long time for the event. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is lakeside again with the captain of the course. Jeremy. So it's a busy time of year here at the boathouse at Kitty Vitty Lake, and no one has spent more time here than my guest, Bradley Power. He's the captain of the course. Uh, thanks for joining us, Brad. My pleasure, Jeremy. Thanks for being here. Brad, 200th, Royal, 200th running of the Royal St. John's Regatta coming up. Uh, how much work left to do for you guys? There's still a lot. Uh, you know, we've got uh, roughly two weeks left. The, uh, the pond is, uh, is finally back to uh, an acceptable level so the uh, crews can actually go out and practice. Uh, but uh, now that they're, uh, they're out there, we recognize that there's all kinds of, uh, you know, repairs and whatnot that need to be made to the boats. Uh, this year we're actually using uh, all of our wooden boats, which are our better boats for Regatta Day, as opposed to switching them around. So that uh, presents some logistical challenges as well. But uh, we're doing our last minute checks. You probably note today that there's no, uh, no motor boats on the pond. They're all in getting their their, uh, their repairs done and their new decals for the 200th anniversary and whatnot. And also behind me, we're painting the boathouse and uh, all the railing here is being painted. So there's all kinds of things taking place. And we just released our uh, draft schedule a couple of days ago. So final touch is being made to that to get ready for the 200th anniversary program. There are countless things that need to be done yet before we get it. Hasn't been a great year for rowers. There's been a lot of wind. Uh, what sort of problems uh, have, has that caused for rowing and the rowing schedule here on the lake behind us, Brad? Well, you know, this is an amateur sport, but uh, people are very competitive, and it's really important that they get an opportunity to get out on that water and get the spin. Um, there have been countless days this summer, more than any other summer, in my opinion, uh, that we've had red flag and they've been uh, unable to get out there. But uh, when it does go yellow or green flag, they get out there as quick as they can. Uh, the activity down here is phenomenal. Um, it's uh, an amazing community that we have here. Everyone supporting one another and even during some of the toughest times when you can't get on the water you see people sharing ergometer room bookings so that you've got uh, you know six from one crew and three from another and they're on the nine ergs. So uh, everyone's supporting one another. We all recognize it's been a, an odd year but it's our 200th anniversary, a very special year for us. Uh, we have 156 crews this year. It's the most we've had in 200 years and uh, this is uh, certainly a special time for all of us. Well, Brad, we're out of time, but I appreciate you joining us to tell us about it, and I'm sure you're excited for the big I day to indeed. come and then probably to go. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, this is Bradley Power. He's the captain of the course here as and vice president of the uh, Royal St. John's Regatta Committee. Reporting live from Kitty Lake, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. Well, it was 30 years ago today, our offshore oil industry began in earnest, July 18, 1988. The deal to develop the Hibernia oil project was signed by Premier Brian Peckford and Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. It brought with it the prospect of jobs and royalties and the promise of more mega oil projects to come. It's an historic moment, the official signing of the Hibernia Agreement. Hundreds of people packed the banquet room at Hotel Newfoundland for the event. The Hibernia is nation building of the highest quality and it requires faith and belief in the future. Now we can truly say, with a lot of evidence to back us up, one day the sun will shine and have not will be no more. Hibernia is 315 kilometers east of St. John's in the Grand Banks. It'll take six years and $5.2 billion to get the oil flowing, and another $3.3 billion on top of that to pump the oil field dry. Because of low oil prices, Ottawa is putting up a couple of billion dollars to get the project started. There's a $1 billion grant and a $1.6 billion guaranteed loan. Mobile and its four Hibernia partners will put up the remaining $5.8 billion. On top of the thousands the of Minister jobs Mulroney, expected, the province will get royalties. But just how much will depend on what happens with the world price of oil. If the price of oil stays at $15 a barrel, uh, right beyond the time when, uh, when Hibernia comes on stream and on into the year 2000, nobody is going to make money. Even at $15 a barrel, Peckford predicts the province will make more than $600 million in royalties. The Premier, however, is predicting higher oil prices when Hibernia comes on stream, which would possibly mean billions of dollars in revenue. And eventually, oil prices did rise and royalties with them. But none of this was guaranteed because the oil was found offshore. It was presumed it belonged solely to the federal government. But that's a question the province wanted the courts to answer back in 1982. We have today 
referred the following question to the appeal court of the Supreme Court of Newfoundland. On province-wide radio and TV, Peckford announced he would ask the Newfoundland Court of Appeal to decide who owned the resources offshore. February 15, 1982, three days after the question of offshore ownership was put to the courts. As a fierce winter storm battered the province, Newfoundland lost something no court could replace. The lives of the 84 men of the Ocean Ranger. It was almost one year to the day after the oil rig Ocean Ranger went down that the Newfoundland Court of Appeal delivered its decision. The minerals on the continental shelf were Canada's, not Newfoundland's. The Supreme Court of Canada would later confirm that decision. So there was oil, and it was Canada's. Newfoundland had only one ace left to play. Brian Peckford would sign an agreement in principle on offshore resource management and revenue sharing with fellow conservative Brian Mulroney, the leader of the federal opposition. Eight months later, Mulroney, now Prime Minister, and Peckford would sign the real thing, the Atlantic Accord. The euphoria would last long enough for Brian Peckford to win his third majority government, but not long enough to finalize a development agreement with the Hibernia Consortium headed by Mobile Oil of Canada. Well, getting that financial deal figured uh, out, well, it took five, five <laughs> years, and it happened 30 years ago today. I love looking at that archival video. Me too. And it's hard to imagine our oil industry being anywhere near where it is today without Hibernia leading the way. Today is known as Nelson Mandela International Day, so we went into our archives to show you Mandela's brief visit to St. John's in 1990. That's coming up next. Time to meet our young athletes of the day. And our first athlete is six-year-old Easton Rogers from Paradise. He keeps active all year long. He participated in the winter season soccer with Paradise Youth Soccer Association and spring soccer on the weekends with iPlay. And he can't wait to start Ken skate in the fall and get into hockey. Congratulations, Easton. 
Ryder Pittman is five years old and plays forward with the St. Anthony Polars. He loves the NHL so much, and he loves when P.K. Subban moves on the ice when he scores. Nice. He also <laughs> plays soccer, swims, hikes, and snowshoes whenever he can. Congratulations to you, Ryder. We're going from happy, happy, happy to the ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> so before we get to the weather with Carolyn, we're going to bring you a story or a video of some more dangerous driving, which we've seen a lot of on the show recently, and this was all captured on dash cam. We obviously haven't seen the end of all of these things. Here are a couple more moments captured around St. John's this month. This is someone driving down the wrong side of Logie Bay Road. Oh the person behind the dash cam says the driver was speeding and as they stopped at the oh. light and waited to turn, they were still on the wrong side of the oh road. Oh my goodness. And then another, this time near Stefanger Drive. Watch the truck at the far left waiting to turn. They hit the accelerator and peel into traffic, followed closely by an Ooh. unmarked cop car. Yeah, right time, <laughs> right place. <laughs> and they're all laughing in the car with the dash cam. And, you know, between the cops and the cameras, you really never know who's watching. And, of course, it's another reason to drive Absolutely. safely for sure. Too bad not everyone remembers. Not everyone remembers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've been talking a lot about the regatta on mm -hmm. the show tonight, but before we get to the regatta, we have to get through the Telly 10, mm -hmm. which is this Saturday. And uh, so far it's looking pretty nice, muggy, uh, but cloudy uh, on Saturday. So I did so far mm. so good, I think. It's not pouring rain or anything so far on the forecast. I'll get to that in just a moment. But first, I'm going to start with some current temperatures. Still very warm for the island right now. 23 degrees in St. John's right now. Happy Valley Goose Bay still sitting at 22 degrees. And going to stay warm tomorrow, especially warm once again in this area of the island. We still have that heat warning in place. Tomorrow, the temperatures will be in the mid to upper 20s but feel like the mid 30s. So a scorcher coming tomorrow for sure. So Thursday morning, we have these showers coming up through across the island. You can see the Buren Peninsula getting a lot of that throughout the day tomorrow as well. Uh, we have some showers moving into Western Labrador tomorrow, not a whole lot. And you can see Throughout the day, those showers pushing towards uh, the Avalon Peninsula. So this is the picture for tomorrow, a chance of thunder showers for the Avalon Peninsula and in through Marystown. Gander looking at a chance of showers tomorrow and 25 degrees there. Cornerbrook looking at a lovely day, 20 degrees there with a mix of sun and cloud. And in through Labrador, 18 degrees in Lab City. Just a little bit of rain that uh, you should see later on in the day and the rest of Labrador looking quite nice throughout the day tomorrow and as we head into Thursday night into uh, into Friday things start to clear off quite nicely you can see the island looking very clear uh, on 9 a.m. on Friday so uh, not too bad as we head into the weekend a chance there of some showers on the Avalon for Friday evening but so far Friday is looking Quite nice indeed. A chance of showers for St. John's and the eastern portion of the island. 21 degrees as the high, 29 for Central on Friday. So those warm temperatures are going to be sticking around for quite a few days, actually. And in Labrador, a chance of showers in western Labrador and uh, 22 degrees in the east. So Friday afternoon into Saturday afternoon, you can see the islands looking pretty good. A few little showers here and there. We have some showers there in Labrador, but overall, it's looking quite nice indeed Saturday afternoon. So we're looking at 23 degrees with some sunny breaks, some cloud cover in the east for the Tele 10. Not too bad, I'd say. And for central Newfoundland, 30 degrees oh. as and well as in the west. So it's going and to be Carolyn, I just have to point out something because the Tele 10 is on Sunday. <gasps> oh, <no. laughs> oh, it's on Sunday. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm obviously not running in the Tele 10 <laughs> this year, but let's have a look at Sunday instead. You know what? Sunday is actually looking 
a little bit better, <laughs> 20 <laughs> degrees, and a little more in terms of uh, some sunshine on uh, Sunday. So yeah, I guess you could say it's uh, the, the better day of the two, 20 degrees as the high, and then we're getting into some showers there as we begin the work week. And for central Newfoundland, a lovely weekend coming, 30 degrees, a real scorcher for sure, chance of some showers as we head into uh, Monday. Western Newfoundland, another great weekend coming as we head up to Labrador, some warm temperatures Temperatures continue with some cloud cover and for eastern Labrador heading back into that 30 degree range on Sunday. That's your forecast. Back to you, Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. It's Nelson Mandela International Day. The anti-apartheid revolutionary and former South African president would have turned 100 today. To honor that, we've dipped into our CBC archives to the day Nelson Mandela came to town. Mandela and his wife, Winnie, briefly stopped at the St. John's Airport in June of 1990. It was months after his release from captivity. Anti-apartheid activists heard of the stopover and pleaded with security to deliver a note to Mandela, asking him to come out, and he did. It is always encouraging to find that uh, wherever we go, we have very strong and loyal friends. And here's a look at our beautiful viewer photo of the day. Any guesses where this could be? Mm. Not much to go on. <laughs> Cotton <laughs> candy oh, skies. Really? Isn't it beautiful? This was uh, taken a sunset in South West uh, River near Trouty. Oh, nice. Yes. Beautiful so sky. Evelyn Johnson sent that in and ignore the spelling mistake in Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> I just ran over to fix it, but didn't have enough time. <laughs> That's two mistakes in this show. Oh, how, what odds? What odds? That's just so gorgeous. She could it get is. that framed. It's frame worthy. Lovely. <laughs> well, that's it for us. Yes. I'm off for All a done. couple of days, mm -hmm. so I'll see you back here next week. And uh, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>